Hey everybody, my name is John Nunes. I've been in deliverance for over a decade. I was the head deliverance minister for Isaiah Saldivar and Ben Lucero, our ministry at The Awakening 209. I'm really excited and eager to share with you today my story. Uh, as a child, I had a, a very haunted past. Some of my earliest memories involve fear, involve terror, uh, involve things, feeling things around me. But I always felt like there was eyes on me. From the earliest ages, four years old or even before, I always struggled with extreme nightmares, extreme night terrors. I couldn't walk down a hallway without just feeling like something was always right behind me. And from a young age, um, I was blessed with uh, the knowledge from either an aunt or an uncle, or maybe even my parents, um, about just how amazing the name of Jesus is. Now, we weren't a God-fearing family. We weren't a church-going family. But um, just as my, my father was raised in Catholicism, um, there was, a, there was a, a, a base knowledge of the name of Jesus. So as a four-year-old, three-year-old, five-year-old, I would often cling to the name of Jesus um, I always took a fascination in the divine, in the supernatural, but I didn't quite know about how dangerous it was and how serious it was. And I didn't quite know how to get out of it and nobody around me did also. So I would often have these blackout moments um, from the ages of four, five, six, seven, eight, where I would get put in this trance, this hypnosis, or I'd fall asleep. And I would wake up somewhere that wasn't my, my bed and my parents would be around me or someone would be around me trying to calm me down and I, and I would have baseball bats in my hand or anything that I could grab and I would be fighting things um, that weren't there. But somehow, some way I got transported into the supernatural realm and I could see and the veil was pulled off my eyes and I could see things that were around. And as a child, it terrified me, and I would fight to death, screaming for any help that I could get to free myself from the bondage of these spiritual things that were around me. And this happened for many, many years. I'd have very many reoccurring dreams about being in a fiery place that was ruled by a demonic overlord. I would have reoccurring dreams of feminine beings trying to entice me and pull me in and take me to places. Um, my whole childhood was, was very haunted uh, just having these conversations with my father because we weren't a spirit-filled family. We didn't know when I was about 12 years old that he had gone to a church you know, seeking help for me, trying to figure out what was going on. There was a member of the church there that recommended to him to take anointing oil and put it over the doorposts of my bedroom door. And from that moment on, I never had one single night terror again. Um, but what I did have is I always felt the eyes at my doorpost. I would constantly look over at my door, wondering why I felt these things looking at me. But the name of Jesus was always there. And as I got older in my life, the devil flipped this on me. He, 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 he took away the name of Jesus um, and removed it from me. Um, you see, because as I got older, 16, 17, 18, um, just through some things in life, I had grown up to become a very hateful and hurt person. When I would wake up, the first thing that I would feel in my heart was just extreme hatred and extreme pain. And so feeling this hatred in me, it would make me want others to feel the way I did. So as a child, I, I was a very good child, um, a, ver a very shy, very quiet kid, but as I got older into my teen years, I started to develop destructive tendencies, which now looking back and having conversations with my family members, it seems there was a generational thing there. Because several other people in my life had this same kind of tendency around 15 through 18 years old, where destructive tendencies started coming. You see, both of my parents came from broken homes. From what they were dealt in life to who they are now, I would say they did a pretty darn good job. 
but the devil is not a respecter of age. He's not a respecter of person. He doesn't care who you are. His only mission is to seek and destroy you. I would, I would constantly have these very violent, uh, vile thoughts, uh, very destructive thoughts. You see, the pain and the hatred that I felt, I wanted to project outwardly on people. Um, when, I, when I would meet somebody, as I'm shaking their hand, there's you know, a dozen thoughts running through my head about how right now if I need to, or maybe I'll even do, it is cause harm and destruction on somebody. I'm thinking about poking them in the eye, biting them in the cheek, um, kicking them in the groin, punching them in the throat. Uh, just very, very vile thing, taking my keys and, and gouging them. These are the thoughts that were running through my head. It was a very confusing time for me, not understanding why am I feeling and why am I hearing these violent things? What is the driving force behind it? Uh, is it just the pain and the hurt that I'm feeling? What is causing my mind to spiral to such hateful things? So one of the ways to mitigate a lot of violent interactions that I have with people, I would often do extreme destructive things to myself. Um, extreme sports, um, going you know, full speed on, on a dirt bike, on a quad, jumping hills, going straight down a mountain, just to see how far I could push my limits. There was a couple close calls that I had in my life. Yeah, I had an I don't care attitude. I was a 19 year old kid. I was still in this moment where waking up and I was feeling pain and I was feeling destruction. And I tried to be as loyal as I could to the people in my life. And there was somebody that I cared about a lot. And he had said, hey, John, I need your help. Um, I feel like my girl is, is running around doing things with, with boys, with, 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 with guys. And, and, I, and I wanna go get retribution. And I wanna know how far he wants to go. Are we just going to fight? What, what are we gonna do? And he pulls out a blade and I look at him and I say, hey, bro, like, if you bring that, we're going to go and stab this guy. This is it for us. This guy is gone, and our lives are going to change from this point forward. We're not going to play pretend. And he paused, and he thought about it, and I knew it was time to go and gut somebody. We went to the dorms together. I led the charge. And I began just knocking on doors. We would knock on a door, we would look inside. Nope, this ain't the one. Go to the next one. We knocked on, I don't know how many doors. Knocked on the door. And let me, let me tell you how awesome it was when I knocked on this door. Because if there would have been any other person to open up this door, I don't know where I would be today. I don't know what would have happened. I, don't, I, I, I can't tell you. But a very good friend of mine opened the door. And right behind my very good friend was this, my, my, my boys who I, who I was with, girlfriend. And because this person opened the door, it de-escalated me in such a way that I was no longer thinking of violence. And I was able to, to question the person who opened the door and say, hey, bro, what is so-and-so behind you? What's going on here? What's happening? This is my boy's girlfriend. Why is she here with you? And he was able to say, you know, hey, nothing's going on. We didn't even know she had a boyfriend. If, if that, no, there's nothing happening. And I mean to tell you this, if it would have been anybody else opening them that door or multiple people in that room would have been stabbed, I would have committed a very violent crime um, just for the sake of, of, of hate and pain. And little did I know that being willing to step out into that darkness what kind of doors I would open up in my own life. And in that moment, I crossed a line. You see, because I, I had also mentioned early in my childhood, I was given the strength and the power of the name of Jesus. Wasn't raised in church, but there was people around me, friends of friends or friends of my mother, who would speak about and would frequently talk about the book of Revelation and talk about Michael the Archangel and the end times, and they would tell me about the power of the name of Jesus, so I would use it. And growing up in the household that I did, I was a very respectful person. And the devil took my respect and he flipped it on me. You see, because when I began to invoke the name of Jesus, 
a voice then began to turn on in my head. And it began to say vile things about the name of Jesus. Curse words that I don't want to repeat. And it would be all be pointed towards the name of Jesus. You see, my weapon that I used as a child to give me boldness and strength in terror was now something that I was that I felt I was using to disrespect Christ. And as a respectful person, I understood that he was the king of the universe and he was God, and I didn't want to curse God. So I decided that I would no longer ever, I would no longer ever again say the name of Jesus. Because I didn't want to blaspheme the name of God, even though I didn't have a relationship with him or know him. I respected him enough to say, you know what, if those are the thoughts that are coming out about my, about, about Jesus, I'm no longer going to say that. I was in this trap where these violent thoughts and these terrors were coming around me and I had no way out. There was nobody in my life that I could talk about these things. And there was a lot of destructive things that happened with getting jumped, with getting beat up, with, with just death around the corner almost mocking me, flirting with me. So I'm in this place and I'm just hanging out, you know, just, just a normal everyday thing. And where I'm at, this person, they, they open up a drawer, just a normal drawer, just looking for something, almost like a drunk drawer, pull it out. And right there is a nine millimeter handgun. And in that moment, instantaneously, when I looked down and seen the weapon, something grabbed my body and I began to hear these voices in my head they grabbed the gun just kill everybody just grab the gun kill everyone over and over grab the gun and kill everyone and without my permission my legs began to move my hands began to move grab the gun and kill everyone and I'm having this internal struggle in my mind no these are people that I genuinely care about. These are people that I love. Doesn't matter, grab the gun and kill them. And, I, and here I am, which felt like an eternity, but was instantaneous, this battle in my mind where my feet and my hands are moving towards a gun and I'm helpless to stop myself. But all I could think about was how much I cared about the people and I didn't want to hurt them. And I can't tell you how or why. Somehow, I gained control of my body again. And without saying anything, I ran. I just ran. I got alone in a quiet place and I could just think, man, I'm going crazy. I'm going crazy. I don't know what is going on with me. I'm losing control of my body. These voices in my head are getting more and more terrible. I'm afraid to be around people and people should be afraid to be around me and I don't know what to do. And I was cut off from the Lord like I had mentioned. I didn't want to invoke the name of Jesus. I had nowhere to turn. Here I am, living the life that I'm living, doing things that I shouldn't be doing. And I'm living with my girlfriend, and I'm experiencing these things. She doesn't know about it. Nobody knows about it. Nobody. I didn't share this with anybody. How could I? How could I share these things? I'm, I'm lost and I'm alone. Until one night. Until one night, Lane, in this bed next to my girlfriend and I and I can't tell you this is a vision this is a dream what it was I can't tell you what it was all I can do is tell you what happened so I'm, I'm in my bed and I get pulled into a, a trance like state I don't know a vision a dream I don't know I don't know the theology behind it and I'm pulled out of my body and I see myself and my body's spinning it's just me and I'm outside my body and I'm just in a room full of darkness I don't know how. I'm sorry. <laughs> but 
finally got my weapon back. Let's see, as a kid, I would call upon the name of the Lord and I would feel strength. But in that moment, as I was floating and I was spinning and I was pulled out, it was a voice, a voice in me that began to call out and just say, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, over and over and over again. And there was no cursing, and there was no destruction behind the voice, and there was no vileness attached to it. I was calling upon the name of Jesus, and it was unlike any time ever before, because when I called upon his name, I can't tell you how or what, but I knew. He could hear me. It wasn't faith anymore. It was a reality. I knew as I called upon the name of Jesus Christ, his ear was turned. In that moment, as if I was the only one around him. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. And it went from, I knew he could hear me, to I knew he was coming. And I can't, again, I can't tell you how or why I knew that. But as I began to proclaim the name Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, I could feel him itch closer and closer and closer toward me until there was an explosion, not in noise, but in color. Colors flooded into my eyes. I began to feel the most amazing thing I've ever felt in my entire life, the most intense pleasure, I, I, I mean, imaginable over every single part of my body, over every part of the inside of me, over my heart, over my arms, over my legs, over my, my head, my back, everywhere. I could see these colors, these, these beautiful colors, these purples, these yellows, these oranges. One of the colors I remember most distinctly is this teal, this aqua, this teal type color. It's a color that I've clung to to, to remind me of the explosion of, of a color that was given to me. And behind this color, I couldn't see his face. All I could see was a man, almost like a silhouette. I could sense a, a man and the man's name was Jesus. And then I woke up. I, got, I snapped out of whatever trance or dream state, like, you know, situation that I was in. In the middle of the night, I mean, the first thing I said is I woke my, my girlfriend up, and, I, and then these are the things, this is what I told her. I said, I'm not gonna cuss anymore. I'm not gonna drink anymore. And yeah, we're not having sex anymore. And she kind of looked at me and was like, what? And I'm like, yeah. And I went back to bed. And then I tried to explain it to her the next morning. People around me, what had happened to me, they thought I was crazy. And I, and I probably was, you see, because I lost my mind. But he gave me his. And I didn't have any support area to go to I was fresh. This was about in February 2011 when this had happened. And I worked with a young man. His name was Logan Kaufman. Um, beautiful man, one of my best friends to this day. And he had had, you know, made a decision for Christ a few, uh, you know, month earlier or so. And I was a supervisor at our job. And I mean, I remember making these jokes with him these worldly, inappropriate, stupid jokes with him one day and the next day he was like, hey man, I don't want to joke like that no more. And, and I remember that. I'm like, what the heck is wrong with you, dude? You're crazy. You're weirdo. But because he stepped out and he took a stand for holiness, he was somebody that I could go to and I could ask questions. I began speaking with Logan and he suggested go get a Bible. So I went and got a Bible. I read the entire New Testament in probably, I don't even know, a week. It was, I read it so fast I couldn't even remember. And I, and I just remember reading and just being so impressed. I mean, I thought the book, you know, was, was all Leviticus. I didn't know that the Bible was just 
power and love and mercy and Jesus going from place to place and casting out demons and healing the sick and raising the dead and responding to these religious Pharisees with such wisdom. I was so impressed by the God who had saved me and I wanted to do everything I can to get around him again. And so my buddy Logan, he, he said, there's a friend of mine who didn't have the exact same encounter but also had a very similar encounter to you. And his name is Isaiah Saldivar. Um, and if you would like, on a weekday at his house, we go and we pray. And we go and we learn about God. So I said, absolutely. Um, so I showed up at his house. I met this kid. He was about a year younger than me. I was 20 and a half. He was about 19, 19 and a half. We met and we began seeking the Lord. And he began to tell me the reality of the demonic realm and demons that are present in this place and that as believers we can gain dominion and authority over these demonic spirits. So I, you know, in, internally between me and the Lord, I said, you know, I want that. I want that. I've been tormented my whole life. My earliest memories involve fear, terror, Satan. I want to do everything I can to get back. I want to destroy what he has done in my life and what he's doing in others' lives. There was a man named Bill Weiss, and he wrote this book called 23 Minutes in Hell. And I had never been to hell like him, but I had frequently had dreams about a fiery place that I would go to frequently in my life. So we met, you know, uh, me, Logan, and Isaiah, and Isaiah's brother, Nico. We all met, and we decided we were going to go and watch Bill. Bill was going to be in Modesto. He was going to be at Calvary Temple. Um, I read his book, watched him on YouTube, and I wanted to see him live. That week, I mean, I, I, had, I had given my life, my life to the Lord three or four times, um, just to be sure. Every time I had the opportunity um, I was just confessing and, and repenting and proclaiming that Jesus is King. And th th see, what I had thought was I had been completely free, but sometimes there's some things in you that are hiding that you don't know that they're there. And I didn't know that they were there. As we began to drive towards this church, I mean, almost right when we began to turn into the parking lot, so turn left. I mean, if anybody is watching this and you know what it's like to have an arm that falls asleep, you lay on it, you can't move it, that happened over my entire body. Like, I'd say 90% of my strength had vanished. And I began to like squeeze my hands like this because I was trying to pump blood in me and nothing was happening and I'm blacking out. I'm getting, it's getting dark. And I look up, Isaiah's driving. And I say, Isaiah, Logan, I think I'm, I think I'm dying. And Isaiah looks back at me, and he goes, don't worry, bro, we're going to pray for you. And I was like, bro, you're crazy, bro. I don't know what this is. I was losing my coherency. Um, and so as, I, as we parked, got out of the car. I don't know if you guys have ever had a, a very serious leg day workout, or, but I felt like I had no strength in my legs. I was walking jello, and there was a voice that came back very quietly. It said, run the other way. Don't go that place, run the other way. And instantaneously, I went in the opposite direction of the voice and I walked towards the church, almost on stilts. Um, from that day forward, um, I had no voice in my head. Um, from my encounter with Christ to my decision to turn the other way and press on towards you know, Christ in that building, every voice that I've ever had left me that day. Um, and as I had mentioned prior, you know, after my, my encounter with Christ, I knew what it was like and I knew it was real. I knew it was real. Because when you wake up and your first breath is pain, and when you wake up and your first breath is peace, you remember, you remember. And I never take for granted the breath of peace that He has given me. I was hanging out with uh, a group of, of new Christians and a couple of guys, a couple of girls. One thing about us back in the day is we were always hanging out. We were always fellowshipping. It, 
it was a genuine uh, miniature version of, you know, the Book of Acts where we would eat together, we would pray together, we'd spend a lot of time together. Um, and this is my first experience in a, a deliverance setting. So we're hanging out and there's a girl uh, that's hanging out with us and she gets up and she begins to pace back and forth. And she starts hissing. This hissing is coming out of her mouth. And then she begins to proclaim, there's eyes, there's eyes, there's eyes everywhere. I see these eyes as she's hissing and proclaiming. So we stop what we're doing. Um, there's a couple of other females there. They, they come next to her. Uh, myself, Isaiah, and, and another friend of ours was there. So we begin to actually lay hands and pray. We begin praying for her. And uh, the guy next to us, a uh, big guy, about 6'5", 220, 230, 240 pounds. He's a big, muscular guy. And as we begin to lay hands on her, he grabs his ear and he runs into the other room. So I run after him as they're laying hands on this girl manifesting. I run after him and he's screaming, my ear, my ear, my ear is hurting. We had no idea what we were doing. We had no clue the league uh, that we were in. And so I begin praying for him and I just say, in the name of Jesus, I command you to release his ear. And in a silent, not a silent, but almost of a whisper, but you could feel the shift of a pop happened. And we began to see blood drip down his ear. And he looks at me and he goes, what did you do to me? And I say, bro, I'm sorry, I just prayed for you. But whatever I had prayed for him caused his eardrum to rupture and he was unable to hear from that ear anymore and the blood began to drip. Well, as he's tending to his wounds, things in the other room are getting a little more spicy and I didn't see with my eyes, but I can hear them saying, she's levitating, she's levitating. They begin to pray in the name of Jesus. I ask for angels to begin to hold her down. And so this is when I come in and, and when I, the first thing I see is I see her arms this way down. No one's holding her anymore. And I could see some kind of indentation, uh, fingerprints in her arms as she began to get held down. A spirit began to speak out of this young girl. And one thing we caught on real early was how each spirit took on the personality of its name. So whatever spirit came up is how she act, uh, how she would act. And so through a process of trial and error and faith, um, we spent hours and hours and hours and we were able to eradicate and drive out um, every demonic spirit that this young lady had. And I distinctly remember coming home at 5 a.m. in the morning. We were there all night, all morning. And I began to walk up to my bedroom just in such amazement because I was face to face with the demonic but in this moment my faith went from here to here it went from a, a belief to a to a no I had seen heaven interacting with demonic spirits with my own two eyes from that day forward I began to seek out how I can operate and how I can free people from these uh, demonic spirits so it wasn't too long after that then my mentor, uh, Nina Lucero, Isaiah and our mentor, he met with both of us, um, you know, just us three. And he, he kind of, through prayer, spoke to us and said, hey, I would like for Isaiah, you just to focus on uh, preaching. You focus on that. And, and John, you focus on deliverance. So from that point forward, I kind of stepped into the role of the deliverance uh, minister, the deliverance leader of our ministry, which we called the Awakening 209. From that point forward, I made a pact that I was gonna help anybody that needed it. And I was gonna be the person to somebody else that I wish I had. And so for the last decade, uh, over a decade now, I have been actively engaging in doing deliverances um, wherever, wherever they need to take place, in a church building, in a home, wherever. We've even done them in cars. We have been faithful in what we have been given and we freely received, so we started freely giving. So God began to take me through a process of learning. Um, I would begin to have dreams uh, about deliverance techniques that I would then begin to use. I be, uh, began to look up 
anybody I could find on YouTube or, or, or wherever. There wasn't a lot of, of content out there uh, readily available. So uh, back then we had a dig and we had a look. And there's a few, you know, old great deliverance ministers that had material out there that we were able to kind of check and dig into. Um, but mostly I learned the deliverance process through trial and error. And my very first time actually leading the deliverance, um, it was chaos. It was mayhem. Uh, prayer warrior females are meeting with this young lady um, and she begins to manifest right away even before she gets inside of my house. She's, she's laughing, she's, she's joking, she's mocking. And so one of the things that this young girl went through, she began to smack her head on the floor and I had a very hard floor. Um, the devil just completely took control of this situation and she actually left my house with a concussion. And I want to share this with all you guys because deliverance isn't a joke. It's not a game that we play. Um, there are things and authorities that, that we need to learn. Since that day on, that's never happened again in my deliverance because I took control of the situation. But here I am, a 20-year-old kid, and I'm communicating with a, with a demonic spirit that told me my schedule for the day. It looked at me and said, I know at five o'clock, you are driving to San Francisco. You, your wife, and your newborn child are driving to San Francisco, and on your way there, we're gonna kill you. You see, all we have to do is wait long enough before you have to leave. Because we were gonna go minister in a church in San Francisco at that time, it was called Glad Tidings. And it told me, I know exactly what I have to do. I just have to wait you out, and then on the way, I'm gonna kill you. Thankfully, by the grace of God, a boldness rose in me and a peace came upon me, and I wasn't afraid. Uh, the intimidation tactics of the devil were not going to prevent me from helping this lady. We asked the Holy Spirit for help. We did everything we could, and she began to curse at me prof profusely. Um, I was losing control of the deliverance, and self-doubt began creeping in. I'm like, man, I have no idea what I need to do. And then out of nowhere, this demonic spirit that was spewing foul language began to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Holy, holy, holy. And I'm going, and, and everybody in the room, we're looking at each other. We're saying, what is going on? What happened here? And the demon turns and looks right at me, points and says, he told me I can't talk to you like that anymore. And I'm like, who told you? The demon said, Jesus. He just showed up and he said, I can't talk to you like that anymore. And we were, I don't know, I'm lost for words. That, that's the best way I can explain it. We had, Jesus Christ had entered my living room uh, and he had told the demonic spirit to pretty much shut its mouth and it began to worship him right in front of us. Um, through that newfound confidence, we then gained the faith and the boldness and the authority to actually after five hours, get this demonic spirit, multiple demonic spirits out of this young lady. And I can say after a decade, this young woman is flourishing. She's an amazing believer and has an amazing family now. Um, but that was my introductory experience into the demonic realm when it came to doing things on my own. You see, it's one thing to watch a deliverance on YouTube. It's one thing to even help out somebody else in a deliverance. But when somebody comes up to you and says, John, you're in charge now. If this person gets free, it's your responsibility, whether it happens or it doesn't. And the devil wants to use whatever it can to discourage you. But the key is to lean into the Lord and place your hope and trust and faith in Him, not upon your own strength, but in the strength and the authority of Jesus Christ. Um, we were doing a deliverance on another young lady, and man, she really hit the wall. Uh, she was really having a hard time. The, the demonic spirits will play on your mind. Um, they'll play on your body. They'll make you believe or, or feel things that aren't there. And she began to scream profusely about how much pain she was in in her back. She was screaming in agony. So we all gathered together around this, this, this young woman and we began to problem solve. Back in those days, it was a lot of problem solving. What can we do? How can we unwind this generational thing? How can we break this? Does she need to repent? Does she need to ask for forgiveness? What can we do to break through? We began to communicate back and forth with the demonic spirit and the demonic spirit said, I'm an African spirit and I don't wanna be in America anymore. I wanna go back to Africa. And we're sitting there like, what, how did you even get here? What, why, do, why are you here? And you can ask Pastor RJ over at Life Song. He, he was a part of this experience. And this young lady said, Pastor RJ 
is a friend of mine and RJ gave me a bracelet. And on that bracelet, I traveled from Africa to the United States. And now here I am tormenting this, this young girl and I want to go back. I stop what I'm doing and I call Pastor RJ Hale and he can tell you. And I'm talking to him on the phone and I'm saying, hey, did you come back from Africa? Because RJ was a missionary in Africa. Did you come back from Africa bringing anything with you? And he said, yeah, I brought back a bracelet and I brought a picture of Jesus. It's like a wooden sculpture of Jesus. And so I said, hey, this is what's going on. This young lady is struggling. She had the bracelet on. We, pulled, we get rid of the bracelet. And then as I'm talking with him, as I'm talking with him, I say, and you know, the, the demon has also said that there's something else. And so he's walking over to that sculpture of Jesus. And as he gets near it, the head of Jesus cracks off and it falls right in front of RJ on the phone. Um, so we begin to go through a process of, of breaking curses and kind of cutting ties. And through the end of it, that young lady was free, but we were being shown a world it's, it's invisible that can attach itself to, to, to bracelets or watches or things. Now, I don't want to sit here and give you the wrong idea. I'm not saying there's a demonic spirit under every rock. When we're covered in the blood and when we walk as if we're covered in the blood, when we walk as if we're covered in the armor of God, we don't need to be scared and fearful. An undeserved curse will not hit its mark. We, we stand in the righteousness of Christ and we don't fear things attacking us. We attack first. Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and violent men take it by force. He says that the gates of Hades shall not prevail. And if you look at gates, gates don't march. Jesus wasn't encouraging us to not be afraid of attacks. He was encouraging us to attack forward. So I just want to preface that saying, don't be afraid of your watches and your things. We were ignorant to the devices of the devil. But as you become more and more aware of it, your faith grows and you don't have to be afraid uh, that every corner you walk around, you're going to encounter a demon. But you need to know learning, what to do if you encounter a demonic spirit. And utilize this. If I'm in that room or any other room and a demon comes in, this is mine now. This is mine. This is the kingdom. You do what I say. You act how I act. And if you want to act up, there's going to be angels. There's going to be fire. There's going to be the blood of Jesus. There's going to be the word of God to keep you in check. And you create that authority and that ownership. This is my place. So for the last decade, um, I've been in deliverance um, over a decade now um, through doing deliverance, through training and developing people in deliverance. Um, and it's those stories and, and it's where I started that I always look back and remember because it, it just shows me that God was always there and it reminds me to stay humble. Um, you know, if anybody is engaged in deliverance, don't allow pride to engage in you because those demonic you know, spirits that you are dealing with they are powerful and they are they are strong um, but by the grace of god we are stronger and we have more authority so don't allow that that deliverance to boast up your attitude be grateful and be thankful that your name is written in the book of life be grateful and be thankful that jesus christ has given you the authority to help and to love people because over the last you know 10 plus years those who i have seen allow deliverance to go to their mind they're no longer in deliverance anymore and it breaks my heart and it makes me, you know, it makes me sad. So I don't want that to be you and I don't want that to be me. Always stay humble. Always seek the Lord. And now let's fast forward and let's look at my life now. From a 20 and a half year old kid struggling with terrifying, haunting thoughts to who I am now. That girl that I was laying next to when that experience happened, throughout a process of time, she became saved and she became my wife. We have now been married since 2012. We have three amazing children. My grandmother, who born and raised in a hard time, uh, a biker gang member, on her deathbed proclaimed the name of Jesus and she got saved. She was a born again Christian before she died. Both of my parents um, became born again Christians. Many people in my life, family, friends, um, had seen the transformation. And over time and consistency, they began to be impacted by Christ. So I want to challenge and, and encourage anybody out there, if you too have family and friends that you're praying for that don't know Jesus, He has brilliantly crafted a web of promises that are for us. He's a yes and amen God. So when He says in the book of Acts, 
believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you and your whole household shall be saved. He means it. And he has set a trap for the unbeliever. For when one believes, that promise is extended to everybody in that household. And that promise is for you. So stay faithful. Seek the Lord hard. Throw away everything that may hold you back. Because he is worth it. And they are worth it too. We're not just doing this for ourselves. We're not just doing it for him. Of course we are. But we're also doing it for them. If Logan hadn't been there that day at my job and taken a stand, would I be in this spot today? I don't know. But be there, take a stand, because they're worth it. And for those of you who are seeking uh, deliverance, who are, who are looking for a deliverance or looking to get into deliverance, don't ever quit. Don't ever surrender. Constantly seek the Lord. Challenge yourself to be more radical than the devil. Be more radical for Christ than the devil is radical for destroying you. There's all kinds of material out there now. You know, my, my good friend Isaiah uh, and other amazing deliverance ministers, they have done such an amazing job providing content out there. It's one thing to watch and it's another thing to do. But I want to say, when you feel discouraged, know that I felt discouraged too. When you feel like quitting, know that I felt like quitting too. When you feel like just wanting to just go away and hide, I felt those things too. So I just want to encourage you, never quit, never surrender, never give in. Because the one thing the spirit of the demonic realm do not have is the fruits of the spirit. They don't have joy. They don't have patience. They don't have peace. They don't have perseverance. And if you can use and tap into perseverance, you can outlast any demonic situation in your life. If you have a supernatural encounter that you would like to share on camera, please visit SupernaturalEncounters.com to submit your testimony.